Welcome back to our conversation around political communication. How powerful is it? Trevor Fungwani, I'm honored to bump into him in the newsroom here at, from time to time at Newsroom Africa. He's also a lecturer in the Department of Communication Science at UNISA. Dr. Trust Matsilela is a lecturer in the Media Department at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. Gentlemen, thanks for staying with us. Dr. Matsilela, let me just sort of come back to you. Um, there's a difference between what parties say in their formal communication. I'm talking about the posters, the TV, radio, adverts, yeah. that sort of paid for shouting. Yeah. Um, and then what they say on the campaign trail. So you have the leaders, you have John Steenhuisen here, President Ramaphosa there, yeah. Julius Malema there. Um, and, and I mean, that's quite interesting because that's, you get a much more natural feel of the person yeah. in those interviews. Yeah. Uh, so there's an expectation of what they have to say, especially through the formal means, like, mm -hmm. you know, posters, billboards, paid advertisement, like wh what you say. And there's something that you say comes naturally. Um, like what, you, you know, like what uh, we heard with Ramaphosa recently when speaking about uh, Zuel Mkise. But I think uh, that natural voice that we hear when someone is speaking in an unscripted environment also tells you the thinking, either the political thinking of a political actor or, or, or a lapse in judgment at that particular mm -hmm. moment. So if, when you are pressed to have a comment on a political actor who has some you know, voting mm. demographic behind him or he, has some, he, he can mm. influence some outcomes in certain provinces, you are bound to say something positive about that particular candidate. Because if you don't, if you don't do that, you don't know the negative mm. um, uh, a response that you might get from the electorate, especially in a country that hasn't been studied as much like South Africa. Because we haven't done like wide-scale quantitative study to understand why voters vote for this particular party, and is, are there like influences, for example, tribal influences mm -hmm. in voting behavior? So until we get to that stage, we will we'll see a lot of political actors vacillating in their positions, especially when you have formal uh, party communication and these uh, unscripted mm -hmm. uh, political uh, commentaries they give. I'm going to, I've got a lot to say about William Keyes. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Um, Trevor, the issue around um, the sort of unscripted moment, I mean, this is the power of the political interview, right? It so the, the politicians are in this position where they want as much airtime as possible, and I can safely look in the camera and say they want as much <laughs> airtime as possible. Yeah, yeah. But each time they are put in that position, they also take a risk. They do. But also what works good for them, I think it's because of, of media, TV and radio, we we'll always speak about natural sound and, and natural visuals. I think when they get into that, that space, they are able to speak about in Van Venek. Zuma did quite, did quite very well, spoke of the calf, so natural into mm -hmm. in Zulu and stuff like that. Those things really resonate quite well with whoever they're speaking to because in that particular moment, they speak about then what those people are looking for. Uh, for, for instance, I've seen pictures of politicians going into a community, drinking um combo using a uh, uh, a jack, and these are things that I don't do in their own personal, mm -hmm. but in their own personal space. But when then it's done, it's, it's done on TV or on the screen. It does so well that then people feel that these people are, are amongst us. They are one of us, and I think it's one of the biggest sellers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of the biggest sellers. I remember an image of Thabo and Becky in 2004, sitting on the floor yeah. Yeah. in a shack because there was an older man yeah. in the room. I mean, that's a very powerful thing to do. Yeah. I've, I've seen a picture of the former human settlement minister, uh, Tokyo, mm. in 2012. He went to, I think it was in Deep Sloot, promised to sleep, I mean, spend a night in, in a mm. shack because then he wants to try and understand how these people are going through every day. But a few hours later, and we captured this thing because we are the, the media. Mm. We put it on the screen, people see these things, and they find this pool as, as natural as possible. But then, it's, it's, these are gimmicks. But yes. it, it works for them, it works for them. Because then, if, if you go into a place and say that, I want to try and understand what you guys are going through every day, I want to feel poverty because that's what you're going through every day. And then later you go into your own machine, into a, into a posh mm. house. It's, yeah, these are gimmicks, yeah. yeah. I, 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 so I, I have a real struggle to think that those aesthetics would really determine, you know, what people, of voters, yeah. you know, whether they resonate you know, because you came and sat in my shack, then somehow I, I feel like you, mm -hmm. uh, you resonate with my troubles. I don't think so. I think uh, voters, uh, I think what we have to appreciate is that voters also have their own selfish interests. So when they go to the ballot, they are voting, thinking about themselves first. They are not thinking about these theatrics that political actors are doing. They are thinking like, what am I likely to benefit if Julius Malema was to become the president? What about Steve Ramaphosa? 
uh, what about Jacob Zuma or whoever political actor is seeking public office. So I think we also have to appreciate the selfish interest of the voter in this whole electoral infrastructure. Um, I, I promise to come back to this, Dr. Masaleda, and I think this is really important, and, and it's a slightly tough example for the president, but I think we must use it. Um, what about the difference between what political parties promise to do in formal settings and what they actually do? And there was a really interesting example of this this week. So on Monday night, you had the ANC's electoral manifesto launch. We took it live here. We saw the promises about corruption in particular. Yeah. Then Wednesday morning, the SIU report into Drs. William Kizia and the Digital Vibe scandal is released. Uh, yeah. President Ramaphosa takes questions from journalists again. We saw it live here. And he defends Mkhiza. He praises Mkhiza's work. Mm -hmm. So what you have is, is the promise on Monday night. Yeah. And then, I mean, I, I can't, ma 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 maybe it's just me, but I can't yeah. put the two together, what happened on Wednesday. Yeah. The question is, would the who was the president speaking to in that particular interview? Mm -hmm. Or who does he imagine? is his audience mm. in that message in an interview. Uh, it's possible that he probably is gauging the support base that Zuelim Kize has. Does he want to go after Zuelim Kize and lend some credence to this report? That, of course, is going to be tested in a court of law, right? For now, there remain allegations of what the SIU found. It's possible that Zuelim Kize might be exonerated in a court. We don't know. But I think the president is has to play this card uh, extremely well. He doesn't want to be seen to be lending some credence in a report that seems to be undermining his uh, political um, ally. Um, Trevor, how do you see it? I mean, does Wednesday night's comment completely undermine Monday night's comment from the same person? It, it does, but then, <laughs> unfortunately, you are speaking to the media. I wasn't necessarily speaking to people at, at mm -hmm. home. So I think if it was to be in a setting, in an out space, where it was addressing people who were asking him about these things, you could be able to a bit be a bit harsh on them but because it's us it's the media i think then there's a way of him trying to twist the truth but i mean these are comrades they are friends so you don't want to to bury your friend because then you you put in a in a mm. tight spot uh, but also i think i've noticed something with, with 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 the president i mean prior the elections he spoke so much about people in the anc who were trying to destabilize the anc a few months later he hardly speaks about these same people you don't know if then he's trying to mm. Uh, clean up or is trying to make sure that I, I don't sell my party into a negative. So I think also uh, this communication are more clearly done to ensure that he doesn't shoot himself in the foot. So much to talk about, gentlemen. I'm going to ask you to stay on for another few moments if you don't mind. We're just going to continue this conversation around political communication. So interesting and so much political communication to have a look at at the moment. All right, stay with us. We'll continue this conversation with live updates for you around the country as well. Science at UNISA. Dr. Trust Matilela is a lecturer in the media department at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. I used the example a little while ago of President Ramaphosa, Monday night's promise versus sort of Wednesday night's comment. Um, there's also a conversation here around the previous behavior of a party. I mean, Dr. Matsilela, for example, the Democratic Alliance will say, and I mean they're correct when they say they're the most racially diverse party in the country and yeah. in Parliament. But then when you start to see that, you know, this black leader leaves, then that black leader leaves, then that black leader leaves, yeah. I mean, I don't know how you overcome that from a communication perspective. Yeah, I mean, that's one of their biggest challenges, um, you know, because it confirms what a lot of black electorate think about, about the DA. That is a, to the, even though they claim that they are most, the most racially diverse party, most electorate think that they are still a racist party, in part because they don't, at the very core, it looks like, DA leadership that is predominantly white doesn't trust black leadership. They still mm. think that black leaders are inherently either corrupt, inept, or incompetent. So you use them as pawns for this election. You have some bumper election um, out, you know, uh, results like what uh, uh, we've seen in the past. You bring some new uh, voting numbers from the black population, and then you get rid of them. What happened with? Uh, you know, a number of them, Lindy, Way, Mosi, uh, and they live in drafts. Uh, so I think their failure to retain black leaders, con uh, you know, it confirms, somewhat confirms uh, this tag of being a racist party. That, doesn't that becomes the message. It, does, it becomes, it is the message. It is the message. Hmm. Um, Trevor, we need to talk about Twitter. I hate talking about Twitter, but, um, well, I don't really. Um, 
But, but there's, there's a lot of conversation around how communication has changed. Let me yeah, just go back yeah. a little bit. Probably from the 1950s or certainly the early 1960s, television became the dominant sort of political medium in the United States. By the 1980s, we saw that. Twitter, Donald Trump, the Twitter era. Here, 12 million people, I think, have Twitter accounts or have access to Twitter in South Africa. Many people say Twitter is really important. It allows people to speak directly to voters. But Trevor, here's a much more complicated question. Yeah, yeah. So it allows Julius Malema, the president, John C. Nason to talk directly to voters. Does it change the minds of voters? It, it might not, Stephen, because it doesn't allow one to respond to whatever that is being said at that particular time. For instance, uh, the, what we always have in SA, the, the, what is it, house to house uh, uh, door -to -door campaign, campaign. Door -to -door campaigning. Mm -hmm. yeah. It works well because then you speak to the electorates, you hear what they want to say to you. And then if ever you want to fool them and see if you're writing something on a paper and act as if then you're going to use that to write the wrongs or not. But Twitter in its, in its form, it's, the demographics are quite different. Uh, mm. Only the elites, when I put it that way, I have access to that. So that even if I have a Twitter account, I don't have access to be able to check on that every now and then. So it means that whatever that you're trying to communicate to me at a particular time, I might not have time to go through that. I could have data when I'm at work, Wi-Fi, to see that and see your messaging. But when I'm home, I might not have access to, 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 to internet. So then what it does is that it limits you into reaching a, a wider audience as far as your voters are concerned. But it works because it works as a form of what, uh, it popularizes a lot of these leaders because you can basically write whatever what they want to write, people retweet, and then it goes throughout and then probably it could win a couple of what, a couple of voters, yeah. So, I mean, I, I agree with Trevor completely. Uh, Twitter increases public engagement between political elites and the electorate. I think you remember 2019, Ramaphosa ran this Ola Matamela mm. Twitter exchange with electorate. And, you know, the idea that a random citizen can get yes. a response from a handle of a president, I think, if it, I mean, it brings instant gratification at that moment, mm. but also it creates this assumption that the president is in touch with we know what we are facing as ordinary citizen and he has time to respond to us the problem is that twitter is trevor had said it's like 10 percent of the population mm -hmm. of south africa is on twitter very minute which and the question is who is on twitter if you look at the top five social media applications in south africa the most popular social media applica uh, applications the, at the very top you have whatsapp then you have instagram is there Me facebook is there facebook messenger is there twitter is not in, in the top five which means while we say it has impact as a, as an, uh, as a social media application, it's, it's use, because Twitter is, the, is the, maybe one of the few applications that is used for broadcasting, right? Yes. Where if you have a message to your supporters, you go on Twitter and you broadcast. I think you see Malema, he does that most of the time mm. when he calls the fighters to go on the ground. I mean, he calls them ground forces. Uh, the problem is it's not the most popular, and that is reflected on that 10% uh, margin uh, compared to Facebook that is over uh, 60 percent or WhatsApp around 80 percent. You bring up WhatsApp. We haven't even started talking about yeah. WhatsApp and I mean who knows because it's all end-to-end -end encrypted. Gentlemen, I mean I'm going to say to our producers we need to do this once a week. I don't know if you'd be available. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they'll let me but I'll ask them and yeah. see what they say. We are, we are out of time. There's a whole conversation to have around yeah. the number of yeah. protests and how that shows a, perhaps a failure of communication but we do have to leave it there I'm afraid. Trevor Longwani, thanks very much indeed. I look forward to bumping into you into the Even newsroom if, yeah. and the newsroom um, uh, and of course you're a lecturer at the Department of Communication Science at UNISA, Dr. Trustmatsilele. Nice to meet you. Thanks Thank you. very much indeed in the media department at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology.